First of all, um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Darren Best. I'm the head coach for the North uh, for BTAS. Prior to that, I wore, I've worn many different hats. I've coached Queensland state teams. I was a director of coaching for an association in Queensland. I've coached ITC in Victoria, coached in uh, Asia, Europe, um, and various jobs. But it all started as a volunteer coach, um, the same as you guys are, with sort of under 10s, under 12s, and everything like that. So. It's really, really good for me to come out um, and see this club in my region. We had a camp out here, uh, not this school holidays, but the previous school holidays, and that was fairly well received. And we've actually moved our northern FDP regional camps to this facility as well. So trying to include you guys in that. So when those dates are out, um, I encourage all of you to come along to the camp just to watch. We're not going to actually ask you to jump on the floor, but that's a really good chance for you to come and see what we're doing sort of at the higher level. Um, and we do start with under 12, so we do under 12 um, state stuff, under 14s, that's called future development, and then state development is under 16s and above. So, um, gr great initiative. I originally started talking with uh, Rachel about coming out here and then got handballed. Oh, Rachel, sorry, yeah. And then it got handballed to Amanda. So b between the two of them, they've done a really good job to, to get this here. And I guess the best way I always start any sort of coaching clinic is people say, why do you coach? And quite often the answers are, I coach because nobody else will do it. Mm -hmm. I, I want my son or daughter to have a positive experience and it's no good when you're looking down there and there's somebody sitting there maybe that's not that interested or there's no coach at all, which is sort of a, a real travesty for our kids that are wanting to play sport. So, why do we coach? Most of us, by the reaction in the room, we can kind of tell that it's because nobody else will do it or, or we want to make sure that the kids have a positive experience. So very rarely in Australia is it for monetary reasons. It's, it's really pure the reasons why we do it. So from that, I think it's really important to ask, what are you coaching? And I think it's, it's really important to think, are you coaching under 10s or are you coaching the boomers? because there is really a difference in the way you address the kids, the expectations that you have, and also expectations of yourself and the time that you can put in to be a coach. So with that in mind, is there anybody here that's sort of coaching under 16s and above? Okay, yep, so 16s, 18s. What about 12s and 14s, 10s? Is that generally the area? Good, yep. So, Regardless of the level, I think it's important to realise what do we want to get out of coaching junior basketball? Are we coaching to win the Deloraine Championship on a Wednesday or, or Friday, for example, or the Launceston Friday night competition? Or are we coaching to give the kids a positive experience for health reasons, social reasons, um, and then also to see how far they can get with their basketball? So why I start with that is quite often we see older Older coaches wanting to win straight away, or I've coached a senior basketball team my whole life, now I have a son that's playing, and we want to win, because that's the elk that I was sort of brought up in. What's really important that I realise in our development stuff is the biggest kid at under 10s or under 12s quite often ends up just middle of the pack by under 16s, 18s, and the little kids grow the most but we've pigeonholed them from the start and their development hasn't exactly flourished the way it should. So that's why I've given all of you a copy of the skills matrix there. And as what you'll see that it doesn't actually say positions, it just says ages. So obviously there's the foundation layers there which are basically movement based. But we believe, especially BTAS and BA are going this way as well, is about creating multi-skilled, multi-talented, positionless sort of basketball players. So we want somebody, whether it's the tallest kid or the shortest kid, to be able to dribble the ball or be able to play in the post, rebound, box out, whatever it might be. And I think the way to do that is to create drills and offences that don't do that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So I would love to sort of have your thoughts on that, whether there's a commitment to that style of coaching or we'd rather just win now and not worry about the consequences later. <laughs> What's the thoughts around the room? This is sort of discussion based. Well, 
<laughs> so I don't have any kids involved anymore. Okay. okay. Uh, so, but my rules of the coaching is all about getting the kids off the streets and on the boards. For sure. Yep. Yep. Um, obviously, the kids here, whether and whether that involves being able to fulfil some of these things, absolutely. Yep. But it's more about having the kids involved in a team so that they know that there's there's places that they can go for support. Mm -hmm. So whether that be support with, they say, a team member up the street where they and they're feeling really low, that they know that they can talk to, right? Or whether that means they see another team member up the street. It's probably not someone they normally hang with, but they start to hang with them, and then it develops their future for seeing that there's people out there that can support them, whether they know them or don't know them. Yep. Anyway, that's yeah. That's why I do. Yeah, and that's a that's a really great reason. And anybody else? I was just going to say, like, I think it'd be it's good for the club to, like, all of us would be on the same page and teach the kids all the same things for the whole group as a whole, not like you said, individual teams as such. But just so we're all, we can all learn how to teach them the right way to play basketball, you know, and build on their skills the same, not just like. In our little individual teams out here, because yeah, yeah, I think that's important. So, basketball Taz and basketball Australia have sort of a common language with our teaching points that we use for the kids. And the majority of the kids that are in the NITP program around Australia, if I was to go and jump on, say, a Vic Metro session, they would understand what I was saying because the terminology is the same. And I, I, being in an association director role before, I've seen the benefits of running similar systems so when kids go from under 12s to under 14s, the coaches don't have to start again, you can actually just build on it. Um, but I think, you know, the intangible stuff that, we'll, that was touched on before about sort of unity, uh, community stuff is really big, basketball has a tendency to do that. I tell a story often. When I grew up in Victoria and I played my junior basketball in Victoria and we had a kid that used to travel from La Trobe. And he was, you know, really, really big and had really big shoes. And on two separate occasions, he only brought one shoe. So we actually started making him tie his shoes together around his back, right, around his backpack on, on the sleeve. And I probably saw him about four or five years ago playing in a senior tournament. And I could just see him from the back with his backpack on and two shoes tied together. And I actually knew it was him. We're on the Gold Coast. And I went out and said, Graham, how are you going? And he was just like blown away that that brotherhood, I guess, is still there. Um, so that, that for me is, is great to hear because basketball is a, is a sport where you can play for Australia and we do sell that to our juniors in our programs and it is also something that you can further your education with if you're at that level with scholarships and stuff like that but quite often somebody in the club will be able to help you at some point in your life whether it's with employment, a reference, education, whatever it is. So I think they're all really, really good, um, really good things to strive for as coaches and to build that community is really good. So we've established that we want to teach the kids to play multi-positions. We want to them to have equal skill development regardless of what position or height or size they are, which is really good. The next thing is how are we going to teach them this? So when I first started coaching, I would go to my mentor coaches, I need a drill. Give me a drill. What drill have you got? I need more drills, more drills. And especially now, you can jump on YouTube and say, how am I going to teach, oh, whatever it might be, a right-handed layup. And you come up with all these drills, and you become a drill master when you first start coaching. I've got a big playbook of, of them, and it's, it's going to be awesome. But quite often, we'll see that a lot of drills don't actually really relate to a game. You know, sort of five-man weave. That doesn't really happen. You never really pass the ball to somebody and run behind them. You know, you might pass it and run ahead of them or run to a wing or something like that. So Basketball Taz and, and Basketball Australia have gone more towards game sense teaching and more game-based play. And I'll just touch on that before I get out there on the court with the kids because you guys will say, oh, I thought there was going to be no drills. But you also still need to have a foundation layer of skills before you can just throw athletes into a situation that they're not comfortable with. So we are really big on game-based um, teaching 
and also putting the kids in situations where they can succeed. So quite often we will do numbers advantage stuff. So we'll do two on one or three on two. So you give them the ability to succeed and then they have you know, good feelings about themselves and they can also problem solve that way. So we'll be sitting on the sidelines or standing depending on what type of coach you are and you'll just be like, oh, my, my kids, they don't make good decisions. And we have a, a really good head of high performance coaching now in, in Australia, Peter Lonigan, and, and he said something to me that really resonated at a clinic not that long ago was, if we want them to make decisions, we've got to let them make bad decisions and learn from them on the court. So Peter had this saying, be comfortable with the mess, be comfortable with the mess. And I know when I first started coaching, if it wasn't going right at practice, I'd run in there and stop and make everybody run. But then the kids don't actually learn how to problem solve their way through a drill. So for that reason, I'm really big on giving kids, say we've put in a particular offense or a style of play, instead of just saying, well, if you turn it over or the defense deals it straight away, you go on defense and the offense goes in. I like to say, we'll give you five turns on offense and then we'll swap out. So kids can problem solve. And it really stops um, some of the kids getting down about themselves if I catch the ball and I bounce it off my foot straight away and the other kids are starting to get onto me because they know they've lost their chance. So really big on the, you know, the best of three or best of five rule whenever we are teaching an offense or something like that. And we'll, we'll do a little bit of that when we get out there. Um, and then how do you expand whatever drill it might be? So if you're gonna go, say three on two, at what point, how do you come to a point where you wanna make the drill more difficult or expand the drill? So whenever you're planning your stuff, you wanna always have something in your back pocket. How can I make it harder right away? So it might be three on two, you might add a plus one after the ball's crossed half court or something like that. So how can you always make the drill a little bit harder? Um, and coaching on the fly is something that we've, we've sort of talked about or coaching on the run. Get your drill going or, or your, your system or whatever it is that you're doing, get that going. And then if kids are struggling with it, pull that kid out individually and talk to them while the drill keeps going. Because we want to maximise reps. How often do we get a practice here? Once a week? Is it? Yeah, hour, maybe, maybe half a court sometimes, yep. So the last thing that the kids want to do is come in and listen to you talk for 45 minutes. You know, they get better by playing. So if you can set the drill up, and quite often with basic explanations, you'll see that I'll do this when we start, give them some quick explanations and get them going, and then correct them along the way, as opposed to just stopping it. And it's, it, it, take, it takes time, and it took me a long time to stop, stop stopping practice, and say, oh no, or I'll just pull that kid aside and give them some individual instruction and put them back in. And then it just keeps evolving. So then you start looking at your drills and you say, well, that kid stood there in that line, for example, for sort of 10 seconds and hasn't done anything. He's just waiting in line. And that's a real challenge when you've got big numbers. We had a camp just recently at Elfin over the school holidays and I had 70 kids on two courts. And I'm sitting there thinking, these kids are standing here too long. How can we make it harder? So at lunchtime, I've sort of scrapped my session plan and rebuilt it. So the kids that aren't doing that are like doing ball handling up and down the middle. And it was just, it was chaos, but the, all the kids were engaged. And I think that's, that's really, really important. So if you go to the other side, you're coaching a club team and you might have six or seven in some teams. How can you practice five on five? Or you do have 10 in your team, but only four come to this practice or five come to this practice. We've all, like, we've all been there, and, it's, and you just think, oh, I'm here. You know, what, what, why can't you be here? But what we need to be able to do is to break down our overall concept into small-sided games. So whatever it is you're going to do five on five, you need to be able to figure out how you can play that two on two, three on three, and put that into your structure, which I'm sure most of you are starting to do or, or aiming to do now. So with that, you typically want to have some sort of offensive structure with any sort of club basketball as opposed to just running up and down and just pinging it off the backboard to the other team, which you know, we see a lot, it's really exciting, but if we can't have a, you know, a direct score in a layup, we need some sort of structure. Do we play any of our competitions here with a shot clock? 
We do? Yep. Under 14's up. Under 14's up. Okay. So obviously the shot clock here, I just want to make sure these are whiteboard ones. So we have 24, 24 seconds on the shot clock and 14 seconds on a reset on an offensive rebound. So Andre Lamanis, our Boomers head coach, um, he was really big in creating a style of play to suit that 24 second shot clock. And he divided it into three equal parts. And we call the first one pace. So in the first eight seconds when we get the ball, the shots that we want to get is a layup first or a kick out three. So let's like sort of bring it back down to the level that we're coaching. So in the first eight seconds, we want to lay up. We don't want long twos. We don't want sort of pass ahead threes. We want get to get feet in the paint, try and score a layup, or we'd, at the high levels, we'd pass it out for a three. So that's a good sort of theory to have with your kids saying, when you get it, explore. We really want to try and push to get a layup first, but if not, then we need to go into that middle phase of our shot clock, which is called poise. They all start with P. So we've gone through pace. The second one is poise. So what poise is, is to run whatever structure your offense might be. So whatever system it might be, whether it's flow, read and react, flex, shuffle, Princeton, whatever it might be, you want to run your offense to get what is known as a predictable shot. So a shot out of your offense. Last eight seconds, now obviously the, the heat is starting to come on with shot clock pressure. We call this penetration. So I've got pace, poise, penetration. So in penetration, we want to try and get heat on the rim, so feet in the paint, get a layup, or get fouled, or a kick out three. So we really want to try and get into the rim, put the defense under pressure, hopefully score or get fouled or both. And I think if we have that common message when we are coaching, it's quite easy to translate that to the kids. If you come to a BTAS session, you hear the kids, we'll get a defensive rebounds, you'll hear the coach yell out, pace, pace, it's one word, and they know exactly what we want. We want a layup or a kick out three, that's it. And if it's not on, we can just call out poise. And they know, all right, we're in our offense, we're trying to score a predictable shot. And at the end, we say penetration. But by that point, a lot of the kids are sort of realizing eight seconds to go, shot clock awareness. Um, if you have anybody on the bench, that's always a responsibility I'd give the kids on the bench. You've got to count down the shot clock once it gets under 10, guys. Keeps the bench involved. Um, so if we can use that sort of system in our, in our shot clock games, that will automatically help with our shot selection and it will actually get everybody involved because if we get to the point section of our shot clock, we're more likely to get it through hands and everybody can get a touch and feel involved. I'm sure most of you have sort of one or two dominant players that have the ability at the club level to grab a rebound, dribble around everybody and shoot a layup and the other kids are just running up and down the court not really feeling involved. Whereas if we have this terminology poise, we're more, more likely to get those kids involved. So now we've got what is called a style of play. This is our style of play. This is how we want to play. There's other teams that obviously play really slow. A lot of high schools in America that don't have a shot clock or even the college game, it's a 30 second shot clock. They play a lot slower. They want to make the defense really grind. And then you've got teams like Golden State, which is pace for the first probably 16 seconds they want to just shoot threes, kick ahead threes, doesn't matter what it is. But I think this is the simplest way that the kids will learn how to play and have equal sections of the shot clock and it's also translatable to what they do if they ever come to us, to our program. So we've got our system of play, now we need to come up with a style of play. As in, uh, sorry, we've got our style of play, now we need to come up with a system of play. So, what are some offences that we run here at Deloraine? Not many, I would No. <laughs> so, what sort of... I don't mean that rudely, but... No, no, no. Really true. No, that's... We're just sort of like, yeah, that's one thing I was... You sort of, with them being young or at different levels, you kind of sometimes think, well, when you start introducing stuff without overcoming... Overdoing them? Yeah, like, absolutely. You don't want them to be so focused on what they need to be doing. Yeah. Get to the so if I was to give you a quick quick rundown, sort of under 10s, let them go, work on their skills, you know, teach them pivoting and all the things that are in the skills matrix here. Um, under 12s, you want 
to have some sort of concept of passing and cutting, spacing, you know, not just a big herd of players running around the ball. And same defensively. So under 12s, you'd want them to have some sort of uh, understanding of ball you men and sort of not only being stuck to your player and having an awareness of where the ball is and also where your player is. So with that, that's actually made it really easy for me for what I'm going to show today. But quite often when I ever think of what um, system of play I would apply to a certain group, I would think, well, first of all, why are we running an offence? It's to score. And let's just spitball some ideas out here and some things that we would think would create a good offence. So obviously to score is the first one. So I'll start by saying player movement. What are some other things that we think would help an offence or contribute to a good offence? So, yep, player movement, ball movement, that's the second one on my list here. Or, yep, spacing, definitely. Don't want kids running on top of each other unless we've got some sort of screening action going. Yep. So what? So obviously the, the overall picture of that is to score. That's why we run an offence and we do that by having player movement and ball movement. But ideally it's to create some sort of mismatch, isn't it? So it's to get either it's a numbers advantage. We might try and end up with a 5 on 4 or 3 on 2 or even a 2 on 1. Or an individual skill match where the centre, for example, might switch out onto a point guard if we've ran some sort of screening action and they got confused and switched. So we really are running an offence to try and generate some sort of mismatch, whether it's numbers or ability to try and get a score. So if we have an offence that has player movement, ball movement, can, cre can create mismatches, we're halfway there to having a plan for why we want to play. I also think it's really good to, in any offence, it's to have designed rules and some potential roles depending on where you are in that offence. So it's a set system that the kids know what they're going to do. Who here is sort of was around and, and watched sort of the NBA, uh, the NBL in the 90s when the Melbourne Tigers were kind of around? No one? Anyone heard of the Melbourne Tigers? I'm sure. All right, so they, they're famous for their shuffle offence which is a, a hybrid of the Princeton offence, which is a set pattern that they just run over and over and over and over and over. And eventually, either individual offence will take brilliance or the defence breaks down. So they're really famous for that. And that's how basketball was being coached here in, in Australia for a long time. You run a set pattern, whether it's a shuffle, the Princeton or the flex offence or whatever it is. Whereas now we're going more to creating game players that can make a decision and we just give them a rough shell of what we want them to do. So offences like that are your read and react, your pass and cut, um, our flow offence that we run at, at um, Taz and the Boomers run. It's all just a shell but at any point anyone's allowed to drive or anyone's allowed to pass. In some of those older offences you were, you were only to set a screen here and then you had to run over here and the kids sort of are becoming robots and that's not a fun way to play. As soon as you take them out of that system and put them somewhere else, they don't actually know how to play the game. So, well. What's that, sorry? Well. Definitely, definitely at, at a lower level it is. Obviously at a higher level they have their counters and stuff for that. But um, I think that's really good. So our offence that we're going to have, we want to make sure they tick all of those boxes, which, which it does, the, re the read and react, which we're going to put in. Is it equal opportunity? So this offence will be. So the offence that we're going to put in and I'll put out there on the court is read and react, which is pass, cut and replace, which is very, very simple. We're not going to spend much time on it in here because I'd rather show you on the court how to teach it so you guys can um, figure that out when we go on the court. The only thing that I would encourage you to do when we're out there is just I will reiterate to you what the teaching points and the keywords in that offence is, so then obviously you can pass that on to your kids. So we've, we've got our offence for now. How are we going to teach it? We've decided we're going to try and do game-based teaching as opposed to just, you know, passing and, and just standing or go, you run to that line type thing. And we will have one drill that does a little bit of that today, but we've decided we want to use our best of five numbers advantage type system. And then, how do we plan for practice? 
typically, what do we do? We either, uh, all of us here sort of, well, we've established that at the start, no, no one here is a full-time coach. So we're coming from work or we're coming from school or uni or whatever it is. And quite often we're flying here, whether it's in traffic or whatever, and we get here sort of 10 minutes before practice and what do we do? And we wing it. <laughs> we wing it. And I used to do that too. I, I would walk in, I would walk in and say, I've been coached for a long time, I don't, I don't need to worry about it. And then all of a sudden something doesn't happen right and you're unprepared and you say, go and get a drink. What do I do? What, what, what do I do now? And I, I just want to point out that I'm not saying this from up here. I'm saying it, I've been there, I've done it for sure. We all go in there and what do I do now? And we get stuck in teaching drills or running sessions that we're good at. I like three man weave. I'm going to run three man weave for 25 minutes of my one hour practice. <laughs> We've all done that. So now it's a challenge. Are you teaching drills or implementing drills and, and game based stuff now in your practices that you're good at or that you like teaching or are good at teaching or is it what your group actually needs? And this comes down to planning, which is, is very hard if you don't have a lot of time. But if you get some simple methods of planning your practices out, which we're going to work on now a little bit, it will actually make it a lot easier for you and you'll be able to find that you will actually recycle parts of your session plan. So once you've got sort of a bank of stuff to work on, you'll be able to draw on them and keep using them. You just switch sections of them out. So everybody here has some pen and paper. Yep, so did we print the session plans out? There's some, I think that's, yep, yeah, that, that's it right there. So whenever I plan a session, um, I, I type mine up and that's simply because we have a lot of network coaches that come and help with our state development stuff and my handwriting is atrocious, that's why I'm sort of really minimising what I put on the board here. Um, but if it's just for yourself, handwriting it is no problem. I find when I type it up, I can save it on the computer and I can copy and paste certain sections out of it. But there's, this is the most basic format to do it and it has three columns. Sometimes you have a fourth and I'll explain that later. But the first one is the time. The first column would be the time. How long are you going to run this segment of practice for? So that keeps you on track. The middle part is the content. Does the drill have a name? What are you actually looking for in this drill regarding organisation? So it's the content. So if we look at this, this first, um, first one that I've put in here, Lamanus ball handling, groups of two, one ball each, standing opposite each other, same side plus add in an X a crossover. Now I know what that means because obviously it's for me, but straight away I can look at my session plan and go, partner up, one ball between two, stand opposite each other. Just straight away, you're in it. On your younger age group, sometimes saying partner up is a nightmare. <laughs> I don't want to be with him or I don't want to be with her. Um, so it's, easy, it's easiest just to say grab the person to your right and grab them or you can play like a clumping game, you know, hop on your right foot and go and find some, like hop next to the person nearest you and they don't realise that they've done that. Um, so that's our middle section. This is the content. What is the drill or, or what is the overall theme which is your heading? How does it work? What have we got in it? it? And you can see here for this boomer layup, I've done a little drawing on fast draw and put that in there. That's more for your guys' reference if you want to use that a little bit later. The, the right-hand column is your points of emphasis. This is your teaching points. What are you going to coach during that drill? So for example, this Lamanus ball handling one, you can see here, I will be reiterating these teaching points while I'm coaching on the fly. I'll be saying, have an athletic stance have bent knees, bent elbows, ball control, use both sides of your body. Those are the types of things that you can keep saying to the kids. And having teaching points actually makes you a better coach and it sounds like you've got a common message to your students or your athletes. And if any parent turns up and says, oh, I can help, you can say, this is, this is what we're doing, right, we've got it. So the fourth column 
is something that you typically do sort of at a higher level and I put in what is acceptable in that drill. So at what point will I stop it and say, no, nah, this isn't okay, now I'm not comfortable with the mess and we actually need to, I need to re-explain it to the, to the athletes. I think at sort of the lower levels, everything's okay because we're trying to build their confidence and have a good go. Where when, if we're at a state development session and someone's not getting it or the group's not getting it, we need to stop, pull them back in and refocus. So I've left that um, right-hand column out, the fourth one, because of the area that we're in and the environment that we're in. 